thank you for joining us today. Uh, other presentation about it wasn't me attack, attacking industrial uh, wireless sensor mesh networks. Um, so we're, I'm Erin, this is Matthijs, uh, we're both from the Netherlands. Um, as you can see, we had two options to come here. You can, you can, you know, we, we didn't take the car, uh, but Google actually showed two ways and I thought it was nice to show how far away it is by car. Uh, but we're here to actually discuss something about uh, wireless sensor networks and specifically two protocols, uh, wireless hard and ISO 100. Um, anybody familiar with those protocols, has heard about them before? Any hands? <laughs> yeah, one in the back. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so it's, it's quite new to you all. Okay, that's, uh, that's good to know because it's, it's actually being used a lot in, the, in this region uh, as well in uh, oil and gas fields and so, um, but I think it's good to first look at, at the sort of industrial evolution uh, that, that took place. So we're talking here about ICS uh, systems and specifically oil and gas fields uh, type of, of uh, systems. And then they used to have like uh, air pressure system, pneumatic logic systems. Um, and, and, and then they moved over in, uh, in, in the 1950s to actually do uh, electrical analog current loops and um, then they started developing further and they introduced the digital protocol so hard field bus profibus um, and at some point I thought well we can maybe also do this without the wires because I mean all those uh, devices have to be hardwired in the field so it's actually quite costly to have all these wires in place so they thought well let's develop wireless mesh networks and we, we don't have to have all those wires and that's why they created Wireless Heart and ISO 100 uh, in 2007 and 2009. And if you're wondering, well, what does it look like in practice? You see on your right, you see actually um, uh, an, 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 a pipeline and you see a couple of blue devices there with a small antenna. Well, that's a typical uh, Wireless Heart device. ISO 100 looks similar. And that could be, for instance, uh, a pressure uh, transmitter or flow transmitter. Um, this is not the first uh, presentation on this subject. There has been other people. Uh, it started off in 2009 already when somebody with an academic background looked at the protocols, in this case wireless heart, and already uh, saw some security issues with the protocol. So th those has, have been documented already for a while. Um, then there was a while there was nothing, and then actually uh, a Dutch uh, student uh, actually took it upon him to look at wireless heart as well. And he also has released his, uh, his thesis uh, paper, which is available as well. Um, but he had a lot of issues uh, with, because there were not many tools available to actually look at those protocols. And he tried to actually um, develop something using software-defined radio. Um, I hope you're all familiar with software-defined radio. If not, Transmicro actually has a CTF about it, so then you can get some experience as well. Um, but basically, um, you, you define the, the low-level uh, logic uh, radio blocks in software, and, and you have to demodulate the signal yourself. It actually can be quite cumbersome to, to do this for a more advanced protocol, what we're looking at right now. So the, actually, he didn't really succeed in, in, in uh, be, um, f being able to communicate with an existing wireless heart network. So we, we uh, also did research, which was presented earlier in Miami at the S4 conference, where we looked specifically at, at wireless heart uh, again. And, and how you could attack wireless heart. Um, we not only looked at the protocol, but also the implementation, so the devices. And we, we mentioned some, some earlier research further on in the presentation. Um, again, at the S4 conference, there was a denial of service attack on, on, on the same protocols. Um, and, and that again was done on, on STR uh, hardware. Uh, so, but basically nobody released his tools publicly. So basically we're still back at, at the uh, position that there is there are no, no security tools available to actually test these networks. And, and um, I'm not sure if you have heard of Joshua Wright and he has something that's called the Wright Principle and he says, well, basically security does not improve until practical tools for exploration are available to actually research uh, those protocols. So we took it upon us to see if we could develop something uh, to actually make that more practical. 
Um, just a little bit of background, uh, what type of systems we're looking at. We're looking at industrial processes, so control loops. And in a typical uh, system like this, you see a feedback loop. Uh, I don't have a pointer, but uh, on, on your right, you see, for instance, uh, a flow transmitter. So the, there's, there's uh, fluid going to the pipeline, and that's actually measuring the flow. And that's sending a signal back, uh, the, the, the arrow going up to the left, and it's actually measuring process value. So it's, it's reporting back, I'm, I'm, I'm measuring this flow rate. And, and typically that's the, the link that's being implemented with, with the wireless protocol. So it's more about monitoring, measuring. And it actually goes back to a, to a controller. And that controller has also set points. Um, so um, it, it, it will actually compare those values. So it will compare the process value with uh, the set point. And if, if um, they're not in, in balance or it's not within range, they actually control the, the valve, which is also in the, on the pipeline, and actually um, change the, the position of the valve so that the flow rate changes within the specs of the, of the process. So that's the typical f feedback loop you, you have in this, uh, these processes. Um, regardless if it's wireless or not. And then, uh, well, some, some introduction about wireless heart. It's based actually on the heart protocol. Anybody familiar with the heart protocol? Hands? No, oh, it's hard for me to see, but okay. Um, so basically the heart protocol is, a, is, is an older protocol which was originally developed by Rosemount and uh, that's also being used on, on, the, on the wired connections. Um, so, so basically they took the same uh, same heart protocol, and, and instead of the the, the the wired connection, they transmitted, they trans transformed it into a wireless protocol. So that became wireless heart. So the top layer is actually the application layer. It's actually this, uh, this exact same protocol and has been used for many years. Um, luckily, and 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 that's um, not that common in, in ICS world. They do support encryption in the protocol, so that's a good thing. Uh, but they do support uh, AS encryption. And of course, that's symmetric encryption. So always the first question is, where are the keys? Because I mean, you need to have a shared secret. You need to have a key somewhere. And that's what we looked at earlier already as well. Um, the wireless technology is actually based on, on a time-synced mesh protocol, which was developed by, by Dust Networks, um, which is now part of analog devices. But they actually provide the radio system on a chip um, for the various vendors. So although you see a lot of different vendors on the, on the slide, like uh, ABB and Siemens, they usually all use the same radio sock, at least from what we've seen in, in earlier research. Um, and if we look at, at ISA 100, um, it's, it's a bit different. It actually relies on, on several standards. So it's, it's a common, uh, so six low WPAN, which is actually a, a mix of IPv6 and UDP. Um, so it has a bit different protocol stack. It's also to able to tunnel other protocols. So for instance, if you have hard, you can tunnel that over ISA 100 as well. Uh, it's mainly developed by a company called Nevis. Um, and there's actually multiple vendors who provide uh, the chips, so there's the, the, the radio socks, uh, there's, uh, there's a couple of them. So typical topology, what does it look like? Um, well, all the way at the bottom you have the field devices, so those are actually the devices measuring uh, the values uh, like the, the flow, temperature, etc. Um, and you have two variants. So you have the, the, the field device, which is already a wireless heart or an ISA 100 device. Or sometimes you have the, the traditional field devices who are still wired, but they have an adapter to actually transmit, uh, to transmit the sickness wirelessly up to the, to the gateway. Um, so that's a gateway, network manager, and security manager is usually just one device. And for instance, on the right side, you see a, a device from, uh, from Amazon Rosemount. This is what a, what a wireless hard gateway uh, looks like. Um, so it's, um, it, those are devices that, that are being used in the field. So it's all uh, a lot of metal, uh, water, water resistant, uh, even explosion resistant. 
Um, but those uh, device uh, gateways are actually hooked up to the plant automation network, and those will, will send the information upwards to the rest of the of the applications that are running on there. Um, and basically, the, the field devices itself are able to create a mesh network, so they have redundant paths, um, and they um, they can forward messages for other uh, field devices which are out of range of the of the gateway. Well, if you look at the protocol stacks, um, you actually see that that wireless heart and heart are, are very similar um, for the top layers at least, and of course the the lower layers are, are different. So for the heart, we use the the analog and digital signaling over over hardwired uh, connections, but for wireless heart, of course, we have we have uh, an, a common base layer, both IC100 and wireless heart. This ADA215.4, uh, which is also used by protocols like Zigbee. Uh, so so there's there's multiple protocols who actually use the same the same uh, lower layer. So it's a data link layer and physical layer. Um, and that makes it also interesting to look at uh, those lower layers and see what the what the common denominators are actually, because both the protocols use 802.15.4, both use uh, the 2.4 gigahertz uh, band, and and both do something uh, which is unique unique to these protocols is that's actually the, the two do time slotted channel hopping, and uh, what that mean what that means is that they will actually hop over different frequencies, different channels. And the reason they do that is that the, in the environments they're being used, there's, there's a lot of metal, there's a lot of industrial uh, systems, um, and, and, and there can be a lot of interference from those devices. So by hopping the frequency, you minimize the interference. And also, you can have ref a reflection. So um, if you have radio signals that bounce off another object and actually come back to you, you can have the, the same effect as, as a noise cancellation headphone. Basically, if you have one uh, wave that is actually at the top and the other one is at the bottom, they cancel, they cancel each other out. And, and that's another thing they try to, try to minimize by, by hopping uh, the different channels. And, and both actually have the same centralized uh, network and security manager, which orchestrates the communication between the nodes. Um, so for instance, that uh, device will, will send out a sort of uh, beacon similar to Wi-Fi to actually announce that there is a network. It will also say what time slots uh, are available for a device to use. And uh, Matthijs will tell you a lot more about that part. But first, uh, we concluded like, well, okay, there's enough uh, similarities here to actually develop a common sniffer maybe for both protocols. Well, that would be nice. Instead of one protocol, we can look at two protocols. So that's what we um, um, we, we try to do. But there, of course, there is also security uh, involved and encryption. Uh, both use the same type of encryption. And they do it at the data link layer, where they only check the in integrity and not the encryption. Um, but at the transport layer, they do use encryption, and they actually have a joint process where they actually uh, have a handshake with the network manager to uh, transport the keys, which could either be a shared secret, so a password basically, or certificates for ISO 100. Um, actually, there, there's a lot of keys involved. Um, some of them are actually well known, as in they they are. Uh, in, in, written down in the spec or, or they're just for authentication. And some of them actually um, are generated during the joint process. Um, if we look at uh, the following slide, it becomes a bit more clear. So if you again look at, at the OC layers, you see that you have at the data link layer, you have the well-known on-network key, which is just used for authentication. Um, and you have, uh, during the joint process, uh, you have a joint key, uh, which is then, again, used to generate a broadcast session key and a unicast session key. Um, and uh, those are actually being used to encrypt uh, the, the data and, and uh, not just authenticate. So for ISA 100, they're going to be very honest. The spec uh, for ISA 100 is a bit unclear. There's many different keys involved, and um, it's not. I mean, this is as we understand it now, because the, we've written 
We've read the spec multiple times, and, and it's still not completely clear how it works, but they have basically they have a division in a provisioning phase and a joining phase. And during the, the joining, uh, provisioning phase, sorry, they already, they have a global key, uh, and, and at the transport layer, they have a, already a key, uh, K open and K global, um, which are actually known keys. So they, they're documented what these keys are. And, and after the provisioning phase, they generate joining keys somewhat similar to, to wireless heart. Uh, but there's, as you can see, there's, there's more keys involved here. And, uh, we still have to figure out all the exact details because, like I said, the specs are not very clear. But the question is, how do you obtain the key material? Well, there's actually, there's default keys. Um, some of them are documented. Um, we, we've collected some keys over time and we've seen that some of the documentation also disappeared from the internet, but they used to be uh, just available in documentation. And another thing is that, that you, for ISO 100, you can also provision over the air. And uh, in the spec, they actually warn you that over the air provisioning, because there are the, the keys they use are well known, you can actually uh, decrypt the traffic and you could sniff the traffic. So it's kind of interesting that, I mean, if you're going to do over the air provisioning for ISO 100, you probably want to do that in a sort of secured environment and not in the field uh, where somebody could be sniffing your, your uh, provisioning uh, process. Um, and we also looked at earlier, in earlier research, we looked at the actual transmitters uh, for wireless heart. And actually, it turned out that the radio sock had a debugging interface enabled, which allowed you to dump the firmware um, through JTAG. And, and that way, you can, you can uh, recover the, the keys from the device, uh, device memory. So that, I mean, of course, you need to have physical access, but that also means that you have to be careful, for instance, if you decommission these devices or um, if you have a device in the field which, which goes missing maybe for, for an hour and then suddenly comes back. I mean, those, those networks are mesh networks and due to the weather conditions, I mean, uh, it, it could change that some, it could happen that devices are just gone for a while. But who knows what happened in the meantime, because you can actually open up the devices and dump the, dump the key from, uh, from memory. So, I mean, you, also if you decommission uh, those devices and they might end up on eBay or the, the local equivalent, um, always be aware that there might be key material still in the devices. So here's a couple of, of uh, wireless hard devil join keys. Uh, as you can see, the first one is, is if you, it's, it, um, of course, it's the hexadecimal value, but if you actually convert it to ASCII, you see it, it says DOS networks rock. Well, you, you can now understand where that one is coming from, and multiple vendors use it because they all use the, ra the same radio sock. Um, the second one is, is, is not readable, but it's uh, at least it's not as key. So it's pepper, for Pepperell and Fuchs, uh, they use this key. And the third one is kind of interesting because if you have an Emerson wireless hard gateway and you reset the device to factory default, this is the keys you get and what the key you get. And what you notice is, although it's not a static key, is that there's a lot of zeros in there. So it could be either sort of time-based or, or based on some information, but they, they greatly reduce the key space here because they, they, I mean, if you know there's a lot of zeros, you can just skip that part. And um, yeah, I mean, so never use the, the default key generated by an Emerson Wireless Art Gateway. And sometimes it's just the vendor name as the last one, which has an Emerson Hauser. Uh, for ISO 100, we haven't located yet any default keys in documentation, so that's still something uh, we have to look into if we can find those. So then we started looking at what hardware we could actually use. Um, because, I mean, yeah, we, we need a combination of hardware and software to assess these networks. Well, there's a device, a commercial device uh, called BeamLogic, that's actually the largest device all the way on the right which sort of solves the channel hopping by simultaneously sniffing on all 16 channels. So basically it has 16 radios um, and, and sniffs them all at once. So you don't have to hop uh, over various channels. 
Um, they have a basic Wireshark detector and, and, and no injection support, so it's sniffing only. And it's actually, it's actually quite expensive, uh, expensive device compared to the others. So we've used it during our previous research, but we weren't really happy with with what uh, with the results. So we started looking at other options. Uh, the first one we looked at is the Atmel RC Raven uh, USB stick, um, which is also used by Killer B framework for sniffing um, SNCC B Zigbee traffic. Um, it can only listen on a single channel at once, uh, like many of the other devices. So you have to do something with uh, with with the software to actually hop on different channels. But the problem is that's a bit older st uh, USB stick. There's no free IDE anymore. Uh, there used to be Atmel Studio, but nowadays it's hard to find. It also reached end of life, and it's it's only a eight bit AVR uh, chip. So it's it's. Well, it's not the fastest chip around, so we thought we'd better look at other options. So then we moved to the NXP B kit. Um, again, single channel, standard firmware, uh, which is not open source, interestingly, but that one also reached end of life. So we, we started with this stick, but soon decided, well, there must be other options. So then we actually um, found this one, which is also from NXP, but it's a newer device. Um, by default, it can already sniff on, on one channel. So either to 15.4 on one channel with the standard firmware is, is no problem. It's still actively supported. There's a free IDE available. It's quite powerful, the, the microcontroller. So it has a Cortex M1, M0 Plus. Um, and it has the possibility to actually connect an external antenna. So it's, uh, although the connector is not on the device by default, you have to solder it yourself and it's actually quite small. So either very steady hands if you need, or you need to find somebody with a, with a rework station who can help you. Um, but it allows you to, to uh, connect an external antenna and, and uh, extend your reach. So yeah, war driving uh, could, be a, could be an option. Um, also, the, the firmware flashing is quite convenient, uh, possible via USB mass storage, which is a bit something that's called OpenSDA. So from the IDE, you can directly uh, connect to the stick and, and publish your uh, or push your new firmware onto the device. And uh, that's a lot easier than some of the other solutions where you have to use JTAG to program the device. And there's, quite, uh, there's, there's actually um, reasonable uh, documentation available with examples. Uh, there's a few omissions here and there, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, well, there, there's enough information uh, there. And they also come with a, with a protocol analyzer uh, software. Um, so you can sniff already on one channel. Um, it also does Bluetooth low energy. So that's the, the channels you see at the bottom. Uh, but it can already sniff at the different uh, 802.15.4 channels. I'm just going to show you a small video if it runs. Yeah. So what you see here is actually that we select a channel to, to listen on and they actually have uh, a con uh, integration with Wireshark. So they create a, a local network interface. And now you can see that we, we can sniff the, the traffic. We see it's 802.15.4, but there's no dissector for the data. So although we can see the packets, there's, well, you, you can either decode it by hand or we need to develop something to be able to see uh, the packets. All right. So, um yeah, we decided to start using this uh, hardware uh, as a basis for our toolkit. And, um, the the nice thing about this uh, this USB stick is that is it's detected as a COM device, so basically a serial port, and you talk to the device using a serial protocol, and that is called FSCI or Freescale Serial Communication Protocol, and uh, using this API you can um, put the the device in uh, uh, promiscuous mode, much similar as uh, Wi-Fi. So you can sniff out all the packets on a single channel. So that is part of the default uh, firmware. Um, there's also a host SDK available with some examples to, um, um, to use this API. 
but um, yeah, we face a channel. With, uh, we, we face a challenge with these protocols because we need to do some advanced things. Actually, the channel hopping uh, um, problem yeah is is a hard problem to solve, if, especially when you communicate over. A serial uh, over serial line, it is too slow to keep up with the hopping pattern of uh, ISO 100 and wireless heart. Um, so uh, we had to uh, create new firmware actually to uh, uh, to keep in pace with uh, the hopping patterns. So if you take a look at how uh, this uh, USB device is constructed, actually uh, it has uh, two uh, chips on board. One is uh, the KW41Z, that's the heart of, of, uh, of the solution. So this is actually uh, uh, has an integrated radio chip. Uh, the other one, the K22F, uh, um, that's mainly a USB to serial converter. So that's not really interesting for us. So um, this uh, is the hardware as a basis for the toolkit, but of course we need some software. As you saw in the in the previous uh, demo, uh, you only have a decoding up to the 802.15.4 layer of the protocol, and of course, as you see in the OSI model. Yeah, there are some other layers that we need to address. So um, we thought that the easiest way was to use uh, existing tools as a basis. And um, we found KillerBee to be suitable to, to do that. So it's e relatively easy to extend. So the first step is to actually uh, develop a driver um, driver support for KLB. And the second step is uh, uh, creating a SCAPI uh, de uh, dissector. And of course, if you want to get this adopted by the masses, you need a, a Wireshark dissector as well. So that was our plan. And I will show a sh short demo how we can use a combination of KLB and Wireshark to actually sniff these packets and that should no oh okay there we go so here are we running ZB Wireshark which is a build of the, which is an existing tool and we sniff on a particular channel and also here in action you see that we can decode the ISA 100 protocol and what you actually see here is the advertisements that are broadcast by the network and the fact that we can see this on channel 19 in this case is because the uh, protocol works like this that it will send these advertisements on all channels So uh, it, it, the protocol is hopping all the time. So if you want to see anything interesting, uh, the, um, more interesting than these advertisement packets, if you want to capture actual data, that is the data that is being transmitted between the sensors, the, the transmitters and the gateway, for example, or uh, the transmitters, uh, trans to transmitter communication, you actually have to tune into the channel hopping pattern. So you need to set a certain channel at a specific point in time. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is basically how it works. You have a repeating pattern of, uh, of channels. You need to tune in. And so um, what you what you saw, saw here, um, the repeating pattern is uh, called a super frame in, uh, um, in the standards. And these super frames can have uh, uh, different um, um, periods, so between 512 and 4096 slots. So um, the 
di the difference between wireless hard and ISS that they use a different time reference. So when you start a wireless network, uh, that, that means when you start a gateway, the network manager, it starts counting uh, frames, and that's called the absolute uh, sequence number. And the IS-100, regardless of when you start it, it will always use uh, the atomic time as a reference. And that starts in January 1958. So in, in each time slot, um, to understand this, uh, we noted that this is uh, defined as a superframe consisting of multiple time slots. The, a time slot denotes a com communication link between two devices, two nodes uh, in the within the network. Uh, but actually, you, you can have multiple uh, um, superframes defined at the same time. So one device can talk to another on channel 15, and at the same time, within the ta same time slot, two different devices can talk to on channel 3, for example, without interfering. Uh, so if you want to sniff this traffic uh, with, uh, uh, with a device like uh, we do, that can tune only to one channel, and you have to make a decision which communication link you want uh, you want to follow. Unless you have a sniffer that can uh, sniff on uh, has multiple radios and can sniff on all these channels together. So if you zoom in on the time slot, actually um, you have uh, in the first part of the time slot. Uh, a sensor or a node in the network is able to transmit, and in the second half, uh, the the other party sends an acknowledgement. So that's all happening in the same time slot. So we face a channel to uh, the, the challenge to actually implement this, and this turned out to be uh, yeah, pretty hard, actually. Um, Serial communications is not fast enough to, to keep up uh, these hopping patterns because uh, the time slots are 10, mil 10 milliseconds. So it's changing quite rapidly. And yeah, we need to, uh, to turn to the firmware to actually accomplish uh, this. Uh, the encry encryption and authentication challenge, well, that could be resolved on the host because hosts are uh, powerful enough to uh, to do decryption after us after the cap the packet has been captured, and actually, if you want uh, to communicate, uh, you can do the encryption part on the host and send it along its way to the firmware, and it will transform the frame onto the radio waves. So that should be doable. Um, The existing tools, uh, Scapy is uh, yeah, a fantastic uh, uh, tool where you can, where you not only can decode packets but also transmit packets. So yeah, that perfectly fits into yeah our tool set. So back to the firmware, um, we tried different approaches and failed miserably a few times. <laughs> so. Um, when you take a look at the development kit for this NXP device, um, you have support for um, real-time uh, operating systems and for bare metal uh, schedulers. So it turned out that a, a real-time operating system is uh, very good if you need to uh, run, have your code executed on uh, particular time, uh, but it, it turned out that it had uh, it required too much overhead to actually follow this uh, this hopping pattern. So, in other words, um, uh, I, I, I know what slot a certain communication uh, takes place. Yeah, my code gets uh, get gets called. But I need to process uh, this packet because uh, in an advertisement frame there is information that I need to parse uh, for 
uh, to discover a communication link that I'm interested in. And next, I want to tune in uh, to that uh, communication. Uh, but it turns out that there's another t task th that is responsible for reading a serial communication, and that is missing the packets. So that, that failed miserably. So we turn to the bare metal sch uh, task scheduler, um, which is very fast. Uh, which is a plus, um, and it works basically like uh, a task is defined as a function with an endless loop. Um, the, the first thing it does is call another function, the event wait uh, function, and yeah, basically it hands control to the scheduler. And it basically says, wake me up when you have an event for me, like a packet waiting. And as soon as uh, the, the task scheduler wakes you, you get into the next uh, piece of code. And there is where you are totally responsible. Your code is running, but you need to finish your code w with, say, two milliseconds or otherwise you will starve other ta tasks, which is, again, yeah, really bad because the serial communication uh, or uh, other critical tasks will, will not run. So, um, summarized, bare metal uses cooperative multitasking, and uh, yeah, the art also use uh, preemptive uh, task scheduling which means that every piece of code can be interrupted by the task scheduler and you have a lot of uh, mechanisms uh, you need uh, to to use to get uh, to to solve synchronization problems so from an architectural perspective um, the firmware consists um, of the framework code that is provided, generously provided by NXP. And on the right, you see the part we had to code ourselves. So for IS100 and wireless heart, that means that we have to listen into advertisements, and the advertisements contain the necessary information that provides you a list of, uh, of, uh, of channels that are available. And uh, uh, time slots, you uh, you need to tune in for uh, for certain communication. Um, so now the challenge is, how do we actually synchronize? And as I said, it is the timing is critical. So um, and it it's impossible to fall to tune into every single time slot because you don't have the time. So to give you an idea how this uh, works, here are a few formulas for while, formulas for uh, wireless hide and ISO 100, which are somewhat similar, but um, have, have some tiny differences. But the idea is that you have to do this calculation every time you uh, uh, you, 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 you want to tune into uh, communication. So uh, we decided to cheat a little bit. So what you see here is the actual uh, time, uh, the, the actual channel hopping pattern. And suppose we are interested in a certain communication between two two, uh, two nodes, and you know that in advance that it will take place at a certain time slot, uh, you can tune into the channel in advance and just wait until time passes and you will capture the packet. Next, you switch to uh, the, the next packet you are interested in and you can tune in, adva in advance. And, yes, yeah, surprisingly, well, not actually, it's uh, not actually surprising, but it turned out to work. So I'll give a brief demo. So we are firing up ZB Wireshark again. 
and we hacked in channel zero, which means that we activate the channel hopping. And as you can see here in Wireshark, we're picking up more advertisements because these are on different channels. Actually, Wireshark does not show you that information, but here on the console you see the, di the different channels that it's hopping now. So, yeah, by using this strategy, we're actually um, able to interact with the network. And that's what we need to, uh, uh, to, to assess this type of network. So sniffing is, is fine and sniffing all traffic is amazing if you have a beam logic device, but still you're not able to actively engage with uh, the network. But by, uh, yeah, using this channel hopping strategy, you actually are able to do that. So, uh, what can we do at this point? So, uh, uh, assuming we do not have any key, so we cannot do uh, decryption. On. Well, there are a, a few documented attacks already. So, one is signal jamming, uh, just by blasting radio waves on a certain uh, frequency. Um, yeah, you can do that as well on all channels, and yeah, probably your network will die. Uh, you can do this a little bit more surgical by tuning into uh, particular communications. For example, if you're interested in um, jamming the communication between one uh, particular device and the network ga gateway or another device, yeah, you can do selective uh, channel uh, jamming. Uh, another idea is to join the time slots which are used for devices that want to join the network. So that way you prevent new devices to communicate with the network. And uh, another idea is to send fake advertisements. Advertisements are not encrypted. They are authenticated somewhat because um, advertisements uh, are always authenticated by the same well-known key. So it's easy to, because these are just documented and uh, you can create valid packets that are actually picked up by, uh, by the devices. So, we'll show you uh, a variation on this one, and that's that we are actually jamming the advertisement slots. So, you can imagine if you have a network where sensors are transmitting um, uh, uh, data, they need these advertisements to actually synchronize the clock. So if you remember, I talked about uh, absolute slot numbers. These are calculated by the device over and over again. Um, if they don't receive these advertisements, believe me, the network will die. So this is uh, another variation we came up with. And uh, I want to show you a brief demonstration. Yeah, so what we what we have here is actually uh, a gateway it was transmitting. Uh, uh yeah, yeah, we actually do have a gateway here that is uh, transmitting advertisements, and on one device we are listening into these advertisements, and on the attacker machine we start a jammer. And this one tunes into the, sp the specific time slots where these advertisements are sent. And we switch back to the victim. And at some point, you notice that you don't see any advertisement packets anymore. It goes silent. There you go. Yeah, while, while the gateway is still running and all, the, the gateway yeah. is running, but uh, the uh, devices are not able to synchronize with the network anymore. And yeah, we, you will basically achieve 
a loss of you on uh, your network. So, um, one step further, um, if you manage to actually join the network, so if you grab a key by means of uh, the previous methods we described, like over-the-air provisioning by ISA 100 or extracting the firmware, uh, extracting the keys from firmware, uh, that, uh, then you can do a lot more. Um, one, uh, one attack is uh, called nonce exhaustion. So the way this works is that uh, um, if a packet is encrypted, it uses ASCCM, so that's it, that is um, its counter mode. And actually, that is initialized by using a nonce. So it feeds the AES algorithm. Yeah. Um, uh, this nonce um, is is predictable, so it contains, uh, for instance, the network address of the sender, it, and it contains the counter or the absolute sequence number. So that feeds the AES algorithm, and it. At the end, the message integrity key, uh, message integrity, um, mic is, uh, is calculated. And if the mic is accepted, of course, the, the device will, will act on that. So if you manage to craft a packet and it just contains an absolute sequence number, that is way higher than the current state of the network. That means that uh, the, the network manager will decide, okay, uh, this is the latest a uh, ASN number. Um, so anything which has a lower value than I, I, I currently have received, uh, I will ignore. So that means that uh, valid transactions uh, yeah, will be rejected. The ultimate goal, of course, is uh, to spoof uh, measurements. So, if you are able to uh, to to, um, to manipulate a process value, then indirectly you will influence a control loop. So, say that. Um, you have a set point on uh, on a vessel uh, with a pressure of I don't know what. And if you manage to say, well, the pressure is too low, yeah, some compressor will kick in and uh, boost the, the pressure. But if uh, you can imagine what happens if the pressure is already high, things will go boom. So, yeah, what can we conclude? Um, we're merely scratching the surface here. So, um, we ach achieved uh, our goal of creating a basic tool set, but it's uh, just a start, actually. So, um, we are interested in other researchers who would like to join our efforts in, uh, in creating tools to actually do attacks on these network. Uh, for, we have a kind of, uh, of recommendation for users of this technology, uh, because this is a um, protocols in use, or these systems are in use for more than 10, 10 years. Um, asset owners are getting quite confident in this technology, because yeah, nobody has broken it yet. So you see a, a, um, a trend that these uh, wireless networks are not only used for, uh, for, 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 for sensors, like the transmitters, but also for control systems, so sending actual control signals to, uh, uh, to actuators and, and stuff. So yeah, we would recommend to reconsider that because um, we feel that the first cracks are already visible. 
So um, what we like to do is uh, yeah, expand this tool set, so uh, implement more attacks that are already theoretically possible. Um, another interesting thing is uh, that um, we would like to to try to um, force devices to rejoin the network. So what that implies is that a, a sensor will resend an encrypted packet that is encrypted with the join key, which gives us a great opportunity uh, to do several things. Uh, you could think of offline cracking of uh, of that uh, that handshake, but also um, attacks like um, having a device connect to a, f a fake gateway. So you can create a sort of man in the middle attack. Um, yeah, mapping locations is, is another thing uh, we found. Um, a colleague that was uh, yeah was good at soldering, and he uh, he soldered this tiny uh, connector on uh, on one of our USB devices. And yeah, you know, we have a good antenna, so we are keen on uh, putting this into practice and go actually uh, do some board driving. And of course, as always. Uh, this unexplored area of uh, vulnerabilities in the actual devices, like the transmitters themselves and uh, gateways. How do they respond on invalid packets? So actually you can start fuzzing. Uh, you can imagine if you have uh, SCAPI and you can forge packets, yeah, the possibilities are endless. So that's, uh, that concludes our talk. Yes, if you're interested uh, in uh, this area of research or if you're actually using this technology, uh, yeah, please feel free to, to come to us and uh, yeah, have, a, have a chat. Do we have any questions? So if you have any questions now, uh, we have more than enough time to answer them. Yeah, or if you feel more comfortable doing it not on stage, feel free to approach us later, of course. Do we have any questions from the crowd? No. Oh, ah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hi. Hi, my name is Saeed. I'm from Dark Matter, uh, from the education section. Uh, the question I have is, uh, you're talking about time slot hopping. Is that the same thing as frequency hopping? Yes. And, and the time slot hopping, is it only in a single channel or in, across the whole 2.4, the gigahertz spectrum? Okay, the, the, this is uh, the same as frequency hopping, exactly. So um, there are uh, 15 available channels uh, for, 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 for both wireless hard and um, and ISO 100. And the hopping pattern needs to be calculated. It's not a static pattern. So that's what it makes it so complicated. So it's using all available channels at high speed. Thank you. It's, it's just a follow-up. Since, since it's a really true frequency hopping, how uh, based on your tool, you mentioned about a synchronization, and that's how you manage to uh, kind of uh, interfere with the signal and block, actually. So it's, it's more like denial of service, isn't it? Uh, denial of service is one of the options. Actually, uh, because we are able to craft packets, we are able to actually interact uh, with, uh, with the network. Uh, currently, we have have just the basics in place, um, but um, as we have uh, this foundation on, on SCAPI, it's relatively easy to uh, implement the application logic as well. And you can do that comfortably on, uh, in Python on your host system. Does that answer your question? All right. 
going once, going twice. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, Matthijs and Erwin, for your talk. Thank you. You're welcome.